Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the CEO Next Door, Season 2, Episode 1. We're very happy that you joined us today. And we are with our co-host, Donovan Morrison, and Charlie Safro. She is the founder of CS Recruiting. Hi, Charlie. How are you? Hi, Mike. I'm doing well. How are you today? Pretty good. Charlie is a, a fellow Highland Park resident. Uh, and, and today, I think it makes sense for us to call some attention to what went down in Highland Park six, about just over six weeks ago. Yeah. Um, as you may have heard in the national news, we had a mass shooting here. Uh, seven people were killed and two dozen were injured. And I happened to have been at the parade when that happened. It was during our July 4th parade. So I figured I would give you a, a quick little overview of my experience. And uh, then we can dig into Charlie's um, stories. Um, so July 4th, my, luckily my kids were away at camp, but my niece and nephew who are three and four. Uh, they live in town and we went to the bike parade, which was before the main parade. And we walked in the parade with them. They had decorated their bikes and scooter. And uh, apparently at that time, we were walking right past the gunman uh, who was perched on a roof on uh, Central Avenue, right in the heart of idyllic Highland Park. Uh, we walked right past him. We sat down waiting for the uh, main parade to get started. And my wife and I, who had have been to that parade for the last 12 or 13 years, decided that we didn't really need to sit and watch the full parade. So we said our goodbyes and started walking back to our car, which uh, was parked in the line of fire. So we started walking towards uh, the gunman uh, that we didn't know was there. We were right next to the marching band. The parade had just started on uh, Green Bay and Central about to cross the street. And at that point, we heard, I heard the, the percussion of the marching band was a bit off. It seemed to be going really fast. And then a split second later, saw the folks in the back of the marching band who were in the middle of the intersection starting to run towards us. At, at that point, we were like, oh, you know, the my initial reaction and response was, okay, they're probably trying to rile up the crowd. They were the percussionists. And then literally a split second later, someone screams, run, and everyone in the band started running. We really didn't even know what was going on at that point. If you've ever heard gunshots and, you know, I was a half a block away, you know, the, the volume, the decibel level compared to the bass drum and the snare of a marching band, they're pretty similar. So it's not like it really stood out to me. So we ran, but really weren't sure, you know, that could have been someone lighting fireworks. It was the 4th of July. And we, we made it about a block or two. And then we stopped and we were like, why are we running? Let's go, let's go back to the car. And my wife, Amy had, you know, the good sense to say, no, let's just, let's just walk back to uh, my sister-in-law's house. It was maybe another five minutes until we heard emergency vehicles coming from every direction. We got back to the house and turned on the news. There was nothing really going on at that point, but our text messages and social media started to blow up and we quickly learned what happened. And um, it was uh, horrible. Um, it was a, a local uh, boy, well, man, he's 20, 21, 22, Bobby Cremo, uh, just was disgruntled and decided to open fire on everyday people sitting around the parade route, uh, elderly, you know, parents, children in strollers, everyone. And like I said, seven killed, two dozen injured. And it is uh, definitely marred our town and has affected everyone that is from here. So just, just wanted to get that out there and thought it 
you know, with Charlie on, we can quickly talk about it and then move on. But luckily, um, you know, Charlie, I know you were not at the parade and your kids were at camp also, which thank yeah. God for that. I'm so sorry you went through that experience. I mean, the, the only thing I can relate to is the trauma I felt getting a text message. And I cannot by any means compare that to the trauma you felt of being there. But I, you know, picked up my phone that morning. We were actually out of town and I saw a shooter at the Highland Park Parade from a friend. And like, I know how I panicked and I still have, you know, PTSD from just looking at my phone, which is absolutely nothing in the scheme of things for people that were there. And I don't know, Mike, if you or your family sought any counseling that the city was offering, mm -hmm. but one of the counselors who was volunteering told me something interesting that when you walk in uh, for the for the counseling, they had a map of downtown Highland Park and you kind of showed them where you were when the shot started to determine your level of trauma and wow. like the, the formula behind it. And it, it that made so much sense to me. And then I was mm -hmm. like, gosh, I was thousands of miles away and I'm traumatized. How the heck are these people going on with their everyday lives being there? So I'm so sorry you guys were there. Thank you. Yeah, I I mean, I think I'm, I'll be okay. And the adults, you know, most of us will be okay. I just feel just terrible for the, the children, especially my niece and nephew. Like it is just, you know, the trauma that they're gonna live with the rest of their lives from that event. Yeah. I, I just can't, I can't understand it. I know. For, um, for both of you being in Highland Park, now that we are a month and a half removed, how is the community holding up? Um, what, what's been, what's been going on and kind of what's, what's the latest there? You know, my, the community has been amazing. I mean, I think that our, this unfortunately bonded our community and everyone came together in so many different ways to support emotionally, financially, you know, mm -hmm. uh, through mental wellness. Right. But, and the same token, we're all guilty of watching the news and moving on with our lives. And it really saddened me how for 48 hours, it was all anyone was talking about. And then there was another shooting and Highland Park was history. And I know. when you're home, you really realize like how, how quickly is we move on as society, but like, it's not over, we're not okay. It's just not on the news anymore. Right. It's, it, it is just jarring. And I, I think we, yeah, I think the community is starting to move on and we just have to put it behind us and then remember and pay tribute to the, to the fallen. And, and I, we have a memorial in town that we've been to a bunch of times, which is somber, but necessary to, to, to grieve over these innocent people that were murdered. And it's just, it's just horrific. Yeah, um, there's, there's nothing good that came out of it by any means. But I no. think that the way I coped was to find selfishly, but my own, you know, silver lining that my kids weren't there and just to be grateful, even though I feel so hard for all the people that were there. Like, you just have to be grateful that you made it out and grateful mm -hmm. that your niece, right. and you are young enough, you know, that maybe maybe they won't have the the level of trauma as a child's a little older but it's really hard it's really hard to stay grateful during a time like that no you're right well sorry to start off this new season of the ceo next door on such a somber note but i felt it was uh, the responsible thing to do to to call some attention to the the events yeah and but, i think it's yeah. it's interesting mike just when kind of going what you off what you were saying, Charlie, when thank you, I received a text from you. This was my first time knowing anyone that was at one of these awful, awful events. And I think it's just interesting and informative to gain the perspective of someone who has actually been there outside of just what you see in the media but actually from someone you know and, and care about um, and just how difficult that is and hearing about the aftermath. And like you said, Charlie, I mean, there are so many of these now that it's, it's, it's terrible, but 
It's just on to the next thing, on to the next one. And I think people forget that in each of these circumstances, the community is still broken and still healing mm-hmm. month, weeks, months, years later. Um, so just to continue to call attention and to hear from folks like both of you who are in a community where this happened and might actually being there, I think is is always just a... Um, a tough reminder, but a good reminder that this is something that unfortunately we need to live with now. Yeah, I'm not sure I'll ever feel comfortable being in public again without a metal detectors. You know, yeah. Thank God for metal detectors at sporting events, at concerts, but I, I haven't been, you know, just back downtown Chicago walking around like Michigan Avenue with the crowds. Like, I don't know if I want to do that again. That was such a normal part of our lives. I mean, we, we've all a, lived in the city Yeah, Thinking back to all the times you've been unprotected in big crowds, thousands of times. It, it's, it's so interesting. Cause I think we, you know, Americans take a lot of pride in freedom and this is not freedom when you're scared to go to a movie or you're scared to send yeah. your kids to school or to be in a public place. Like that's the opposite of freedom. And it does go back to not to get political, but our government and the way things are handled, like we, it might appear we have freedom, but the way we feel is the exact opposite after something like this happens. That's a good perspective. And it's sad. It's very sad. And it's tough when, I mean, it, it, it maybe exemplifies the phrase easier said than done. No better than this is like, you don't want to live in fear, but that is, it's it's tough, especially when you've actually been through something like this to try and resume some sense of normalcy and just the feeling of of comfort that not having to think twice about something like this mm-hmm. that has been taken away from you, Mike and, and Charlie. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's not good. But well, on that note, let's let's move on to something a little happier. Cause I'm, yes, indeed. That really brought me back. I did it to myself and I don't want to sit here depressed. So let's, let's talk about Charlie. Cause that's why we're here today. So Charlie, try to cheer me up, please. I and will. Thank you. And, and tell us about yourself and tell us about CS recruiting and what you guys are up to. Thanks, Mike. So my name is Charlie Safro. As Mike mentioned, I'm the president and founder of a third party recruiting firm called CS Recruiting. We specialize in recruiting within the logistics, uh, transportation and supply chain industry. And we've got about 40 people on our team. We work nationwide and uh, really help clients find the right person for their job at at any level. Um, So we do a bit of executive recruiting. We do um, some lower level mid-management recruiting. At the end of the day, we do have a pretty strict focus on supply chain, which um, if you would have asked me in third grade what I wanted to do when I grew up, I would never have said I want to be a transportation supply chain recruiter, but here I am. Just for our listeners, can you give us breakdown a little bit more specifically and what types of companies are your typical customers? Yeah, so I think that the pandemic highlighted supply chain because it started to affect us at the personal level. Like, where's my package? It's set mm. overnight and it's not here. And um I think when you take a step back, you realize everything we touch is part of a supply chain somewhere. And our Mm -hmm. world does not go around without trucks and factories and Mm -hmm. steamships and all the different parts that create a product and then get it to the end customer. So a lot more attention on our industry, which is exciting. People, you know, finally kind of understand what I do, but We are working with any companies that manufacture or distribute a product, a tangible Mm -hmm. product, um, all commodity types. So we deal with retail, apparel, food and beverage, uh, you know, anything within um, computer, electronics. Um, Then we also service logistics and transportation companies. So some of those companies have their own trucks, they have their own warehouses. Mm -hmm. Other companies are in a brokerage model similar to any other real estate mortgage broker. They're simply, you know, the the middle party coordinating the transaction. So at the end of the day, if the position has anything to do with 
production, manufacturing, distribution, transportation, and all the moving parts in between, it's usually the type of position that we can fill. Okay. Uh, this is a very broad, just industry question, mm -hmm. but do you feel that we will ever get back to the level of normalcy when it comes to supply train, chain that we were at pre-pandemic? Because I mean, I know even still, like I went grocery shopping yesterday and there were no bananas, there's no garlic salt, like there were multiple, and this is obviously anecdotal, very silly, but there, I never remember, at least in my short life, um, before the pandemic going into a grocery store and there would be a handful of things on your list mm -hmm. that you're not able to grab. Right. And, I, and I obviously understand that this um, is much greater than just that and bleeds over into a number of different industries. But do you think we're close to returning to pre-pandemic levels? Do you think we'll ever get back to that? Is this kind of new normal? What What is your take on where we're at in the greater supply chain world? It's a really interesting question and I haven't thought too far into the future, but I think that there's kind of two components to what you're referring to. The first is I'm not sure retail will ever be the same because we all adjusted during the pandemic and I am a huge promoter of Amazon and Instacart and anything mm -hmm. I can buy that will be on my doorstep later today or tomorrow is usually the route I take as a, a busy mm -hmm. working mom. So I think that's one part of it is there's a lot more accessibility with e-commerce and people are just in that lifestyle now. The other thing in tying back to our business that we saw shortly after the pandemic, I would say it was more 2021 and it still continues today, is a lot of clients that completely reorganized their entire supply chain as a result of the pandemic and the blockages with the steamships and all the all the things that we see in memes out there that are really happening. So, you know, some examples of that are companies that manufacture and they've always relied on importing either parts or finished goods from China, they've come to us and looking for somebody who can help them start up a manufacturing facility in Mexico or Canada. So mm -hmm. really thinking about like that ocean component is what mm -hmm. you know really halted everything. So we can solve for it because as far as we can see, trucks trucks and railroads will always mm -hmm. move. We understand mm -hmm. now why the steamships and the ports got blocked. So I'm seeing companies do some creative things like that, just you know, bringing different functions in-house or outsourcing more on a near shore basis versus overseas. It's not gonna be overnight though. When you think of like having to rebuild an entire manufacturing facility, you know, all the people, all the machinery, all the components, it's, mm. it's a very long process, but I don't think people will revert back. Like they learned their lesson and now they're determined to figure out a better solution in the event something like this ever happens again. And that's exciting news for your business that I would think there would be a lot of career opportunities that you can help um, some of these groups that are trying to bring at least maybe part or all of their operations to North America to help fill. Absolutely. And a lot of companies that are just looking for like an import or export specialist, they're not necessarily reconfiguring their supply chain, mm -hmm. but they're hopeful and I, I think they have a reason to be that a person on their team can make a big difference. So you bring in the right person, not to say that that person's going to, you know, get the port to unload their steamship, you know, priority, but they have different connections. They have different solutions. They've been exposed to different technologies. So um, it does definitely help our industry because there's there's hope that a single person can make a difference. And I believe that that's the truth in a lot of situations. For sure. Well, I think we would love to take it back a step on the CEO next door. We like to highlight how the accumulation or summation of life events contribute to and influence where you're at today. So where did it first start for you? Did you have any kind of odd jobs as a kid or were, did, did your family own a business? Would love to, to take it back um, and, and learn about that journey. Yeah, definitely have entrepreneurism in my DNA. There's no doubt about it. Um, my 
maternal grandfather was actually a professional bowler and owned bowling alleys. So he was an entrepreneur, but kind of in a, a different uh, different type of industry. And then my paternal grandfather was also an entrepreneur with a couple different businesses uh, during my lifetime. Both of my parents are entrepreneurs. Um, my mom owns a chain of daycare centers. My father, who has passed away, he owned a leasing company. So it was definitely in my blood. And Mike, I think you can relate to this where, you know, I never as a child had the privilege of going to summer camp. It was just not something my parents did and not something they offered. And so when I turned 13, I had to get a job. And if I was going to be home all summer, which I didn't have a choice, I needed to be working, staying busy, you know, gaining something. Um, so I was a child waitress. And when I wow. look back now, I'm like, there's no way that that was even legal. I was literally 13 years old. Definitely not. Yeah, probably not even coming up to the counter height um, in a diner in Highwood that I worked at. So oh um, I did that for a couple of years. I worked at Nordstrom through college, which clearly um, brought me a lot of value with customer service and satisfaction. And I spent a lot of time in the, the restaurant industry as a whole. At college, I waitressed, I hosted, I bartended. So um, definitely learned multitasking skills, people skills, problem solving skills, um, up until the point that my favorite people to hire for our team are people who come from the restaurant industry, because if you can do that, you can probably do anything. Exciting. Um, so where did where did your first business start because it sounds like those were working for others but you came from this lineage of folks that were entrepreneurs so what was your first hustle your side hustle or full-time entrepreneurial venture yeah my first hustle was like a babysitting business that clearly didn't take off that much but it kind of reflects like the person i am it wasn't you know, just babysitting for a neighbor. And if they needed me on Saturday night, they'd call and I'd walk over. I took it like to the next level where I, when I decided I wanted to be a babysitter, I found a couple friends and I probably was inspired by like babysitters club back then, but some friends that I could outsource and I made flyers and I drove around the neighborhood and put the flyers in the mailboxes. And I was more like the business person behind the babysitting business. So that was probably like my junior high, early high school years. Um, over the years, I had a couple other different businesses. I'd say the best lesson I learned was for me, I belong in a service industry, not an industry that has inventory or physical product because okay. When I was dealing with inventory, um, I had a reusable bag business at one point, and let's just say I have about 7,000 bags in my basement still. Seriously. From, yeah, from just like over, or, I mean, we we did well, but we over-ordered and then we stopped uh -huh. the business and now, um, now we've got all these bags. But um, always had something, just, you know, I had an mm. eBay business at one time. Um, yeah, so I always just had something going on and um, I'd say CS Recruiting, where I am today is, is the one that really stuck and okay. took off. Why did you start CS? It was not intentional. I was, long story short, I was in advertising for the first couple of years of my career. I had my first son and at the time my husband had just started his own company. It was a technology company in the transportation industry. So um, I went back to my marketing and advertising company after my maternity leave. It was a grind. I was working, you know, 60 hours a week. I wanted to have some time to enjoy my new baby. And so I asked my husband if I could come work for him. He had eight employees at the time. I was an office manager for that first month, maybe stapling papers, getting coffee. I was willing to do anything just to be around adults and add some value. And then they went through this huge growth spurt. And when they looked around at the team, I was the one person who had capacity to really learn something or take on recruiting. So I taught myself how to recruit. This was back in 2006, um, you know, pre LinkedIn. These were Craigslist recruiting days and helped their company grow. They sold their business and I stayed on as like a freelance recruiter. And this is right around the time LinkedIn really took off. So positioned myself on LinkedIn as a logistics and supply chain recruiter um, just to kind of keep myself out there. But one thing led to another. I got an inquiry, you know, someone reached out and they said, can you help us find a sales manager? Then another inquiry, we need this person. 
And all of a sudden I realized I had a business and, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't by any means a mistake, but it wasn't a formal, I didn't go out and get a loan and draft a business plan. It was just one day I realized, wait, I've got a lot of clients and I do good work. And this is my chance to either really make something of it or walk away before I fail. So um, really just took it and ran with it. Looking back over your time with your, your business, have, have there been any, I, I'm, all businesses have ups and downs, but during some of those down times, you know, have you, what, what happened? What, what did you learn from those events? How did you get over those, those humps? Lots of ups and downs, usually related to people. Um, I mean, we're mm-hmm. in the people business. I'm a huge advocate for employees and humanizing the workforce, but at the end of the day, managing people and keeping them happy is really hard. I would say the biggest downfall that really led to a pivot and a a life-changing pivot was right after COVID. So um, one thing I didn't mention is when I decided to really build my business, my first hire was my husband. Um, So he had just sold his company. He had a non-compete. He was waiting it out and I brought him on to help me grow my business. Right before the pandemic started, we had made the mutual decision that he was going to step out of the business. Um, He had kind of run his course, done his job, and uh, we made the decision as a family that he would leave the business. And a couple weeks after COVID hit in early April, we had a COO as part of our company who resigned unexpectedly. So for the first seven, eight years of of the business, I was an employee at my own company and that's how I liked it. I'm a producer, you know, I was driven by bringing in revenue and by being, you know, out there with the team, getting my hands dirty. And when I had this moment where our COO resigned, that was really my point where I was like, wow, I have to take this baby back. And, you know, I've worked so hard to grow it by contributing. And now I need to, you know, work on the business instead of in the business. So it was a major, I guess, just a, a major shock that that he resigned. And it took me a day or two to just digest that. But it really made me stronger in the end. Um, it forced me to delegate. It forced me to get out of the day to day, elevate my role. and. I don't think I've ever been happier than I have been in the last two and a half years where I've really been a leader um, and just embraced that mm-hmm. position that it's just ironic. I, I really never led my own company other than leading by example. What do you do to keep your your team motivated and keep them around? Because I know that's an, a very important aspect of your, your business. You're a fully people business. Yeah. So, and, and now I know since, I think it was since the pandemic, you took everyone remote. Mm -hmm. So, so that makes it, that adds a whole new level of challenge. How do you, how do you keep people engaged, motivated, involved? Like what are, what are your techniques? So, I mean, in the recruiting business, I have a very loud voice that you cannot recruit people unless you know how to retain your people. And I talk a lot about that. People think recruiting is, you know, going through a bunch of resumes, choosing who you want to hire, getting that person started and hit the ground running. And there's so much more to it. And a lot of it has to do with retention. And you really cannot go out and build your team until you know how to care for your internal team. At the end of the day, they're your culture champions. They're your referral network. They're the living, breathing proof of what you have to offer. So we put a lot of emphasis on our employees. We are very much an employee first company. Um, So many different ways we approach this, I would say. Um, from a connectivity standpoint, we are remote, but we take a lot of pride in getting together very often. So we have quarterly team meetings that are half work, half fun, and everyone comes together live for a full offsite day. Um, we do monthly optional get togethers that are usually a you know company sponsored dinner, happy hour. We have our summer event coming up this week. We do a holiday party and then This last year, we made this commitment when we decided to go fully remote and we broke our lease, we took a portion of our rent money and applied it to an annual retreat. So in February, uh, we took 30 people to Cabo. um, And yeah, and and it's a commitment we've made to the team that every year we're going to do a three, four night annual retreat. 
And the ROI is incredible. Like it really was an opportunity for people to connect and bond. There was no work talk. There were no, you know, there were no meetings when we were there. It was just, these are the people that support you and you support them and get to know them in a relaxed environment. So those are some of the things we do, but beyond that, a lot of just, you know, making our workforce feel very psychologically safe. So lots mm -hmm. of one-on-one -on -one attention, lots of normalizing hard conversations um, around compensation, around feedback, around ways that our leadership team can improve. We do a lot of employee surveying. Um, so at the end of the day, keeping our team feeling connected to each other is that's my priority when I wake up every morning. And it's the little things that add up. We do a lot of um, internal recognition, appreciation, just making sure people feel their purpose and feel valued. Sounds like a great place to work. Uh, sounds yeah, like don't, doing don't be stealing Donovan. <laughs> all, of the, all of the right things to promote <laughs> retention. That's great. Um, I was just curious, just an industry question in general with recruiting and not being overly familiar with the space. Mm -hmm. What is the breakdown or percentage ratio, I guess, on you or your company approaching other companies to work with versus them coming to you and going, hey, I have this position I need to fill? Yeah, we have been very fortunate. And it was a lot of hard work that got us to where we are today. But right now, about 90% of our business is inbound. So oh, wow. It, yeah, so our business Amazing. comes to us. Um, yeah. We actually am in the process right now of training our very first business development rep in 12 years. We've never had a sales team. It's all been organic, word of mouth, referrals, um, thought leadership. And now we're finally at a point where we're prepared to scale and scale quickly. So we have someone who's really gonna go out and aggressively start hunting for new opportunities. Um, but up until this point, I would say, you know, exactly what I said, recruiting, it's an interesting business because it continues to pay forward where we talk to someone and, you know, we're helping them find a job. And let's say they were the second place candidate, they didn't get the job but then their company is hiring and they had a good experience with us. So then they call us to recruit. And then the person we did place, now they tell their neighbor they had a good experience. And so it, it's a, you know, a trickle effect, a lot of talking, a lot of, you know, I need a recruiter I can trust. And we've worked very hard to build that reputation. Um, I also do a lot of content uh, posting on LinkedIn, a lot of thought leadership, which drives a lot of our business. And I'm a firm believer when it comes to developing business, it's a give strategy before I take. So um, I'm always out there giving advice on interviewing, giving advice on you know negotiating an offer, on onboarding, and really advice on both sides of the table if you're a candidate looking for a job or an employer. And a lot of times that advice just circulates and um, somebody responded to me the other day from a message I sent them in 2013 and they want to hire our firm 11 wow. uh, nine years later so it, it it all comes back around it's just be kind to people mm -hmm. golden rule and be patient but um, we've been fortunate we've worked hard to be fortunate but the business tends to come to us on you that, that go, go ahead mike uh, you you've obviously built a, a very impressive business and it's it's all you know a lot of it is your your team so creating creating this team i'm i'm curious what techniques you use to find the folks that you bring onto your team how do you find them how do you screen them you know i saw on your linkedin about myers briggs like are you putting them through personality type tests like what is what's your process we we pay a lot of attention to our process so we can then use it as a best practice for our clients so mm -hmm. Um, that's a great question and something that for many years, we didn't have a team that was big enough to really experiment. And now with 40 people, I would say we have mastered our interview process. And of course, we've mastered our recruiting process. If we hadn't, I'd, I'd be concerned. But um, being able now to, to take these different technologies, these processes, these philosophies, and share them with clients to help improve their interview process. So. Um, our recruiters know what to look for, and 
a lot of our hires have actually come to us as candidates and just something clicked when they were talking to a recruiter and the recruiter, you know, probed and, and brought up the opportunity to join our team and usually it, it led to a hire. So um, we've done a lot of hiring within our industry. And so that whole process has just played out very well where, you know, we're focused on our industry. We'll talk to a candidate looking for a new job. And lo and behold, they end up working at our firm because of that initial connection. That's very convenient. You don't necessarily even need to go looking for people. They're showing up at your doorstep. Exactly. In a way, easier said than done. Yeah, but yeah. we also, of course, leverage all the resources that we do for a real search with clients. So mm -hmm. um, we have a very in-depth, diverse database that is all professionals in our industry that we've built for 12 years. Um, and we also, we give a lot of credit to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an amazingly powerful tool for networking, connecting, learning about someone's background. Um, and then of course, like the resume sites, but I'd say we're, we're pretty creative when it comes to the sourcing and actually finding the people we want to solicit. That's a big part of the process. And that would think probably would lead to pretty high retention just given the nature mm -hmm. of your business. Because if you're doing this day in and day out for other organizations, you know exactly the type of person, profile, skill set, temperament, EQ, like who you want bringing into the organization. So I would think that once you make that hire, you're, you can be pretty confident that it's going to be the right person and that they will stick around for a while. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, we're not perfect. We've hired the wrong person before, we've learned from our mistakes, um, but we do have a very loyal team. Um, we have two of our, our first number one and number two employee after I, I hired Chad, my husband, um, are still with us today. They both just hit 10 years, took a month sabbatical as a reward for the decade of service with our firm. This week, we're celebrating two eight-year anniversaries. Next week, we have a six-year anniversary. So we do a lot to keep our team happy, keep them challenged. Also really proud that we have three, what we call like boomerang employees. So these are people that were part of our firm, left for another opportunity, realized the grass is not greener and came back to our firm and we rehired them. So um, I'd say we definitely, there's more good than bad, but We've also, you know, we're we're all guilty and one out of every 10 hires generally doesn't make it for a variable out of your control. And that's a that's a global stat. So that's kind of how we go into this is, you know, one out of every 10 is probably not going to make it. And we just have to give ourselves grace that we are looking at the right things, asking the right questions, using data to make these decisions. But humans are humans there's emotions there's there's a lot going on that can really affect work and you have no control over it charlie you are somewhat of a linkedin celebrity how did you become a celebrity on linkedin how, you have so many followers i'm just looking Forty-three thousand followers do you know forty-three thousand people they're all in my industry. Well, okay. almost all of them are in my industry, but um, no, I do not know them all, but okay. that's, the, that's the power of the platform is I'm one click away from knowing them. So um, when I started recruiting, I was on LinkedIn all hours of the day. Funny story, I had actually, when, when our business really took off and it was official, I had just had my third son and I was up all night feeding my baby and I would sit on my laptop and just connect with people to the point that I would get warnings from LinkedIn's security team because they would say, mm. there's no way that you're on this IP address all day and then you're back on the IP address all night. Oh and God. yeah, like threatening to like suspend my account because they thought I had a bot working for me after hours. So that's how I built my connection base. Um, LinkedIn only lets you have 30,000 connections and then they, tap you out and you have to convert to followers. So getting the 30,000 connections, I don't want to say it was easy by any means. It took me 10 years, but at least I could reciprocate. Like you want to connect with me, I'll connect back. Right. Now that I'm chasing followers, it's it's much harder. Like those 13,000 followers I've gained, really I have to give them something of serious value so they follow me because I can't connect with them or really give anything back to them other than my content. So um, it's hard, but I'm committed. I'm consistent. I'm always thinking about LinkedIn. 
And you are very generous with your content and helpful and it is robust. Uh, how do you how do you make the time and how often are you posting? I post at least five days a week, sometimes seven days. And wow. when I get like a spark of creativity, I try to just go with the flow. And sometimes it's 9 p.m., sometimes it's Saturday <laughs> afternoon. But when I'm in that mode of having ideas and writing and researching, I've just created this massive library of content. So I challenge myself every day to put something fresh and original out there. And then if I don't have a topic or a trend I wanna talk about, I'll you know dive into my library and pick something that feels relevant. Um, but I take a walk most mornings and I use that morning walk to really you know think about what, what I wanna talk about that day. Sometimes it takes off, sometimes it doesn't, but it's all about, you know, putting yourself out there and at least at least being motivated to do that. You're very creative. And Thanks. that is impressive. That is hard work. It's hard work. It could be your full-time job. It could be, and yeah. it's not even a part of my job. So, yeah. Uh, let's see what else we want to talk about. How about let's I want to go back to your your upbringing, your grandparents were entrepreneurs, your parents were entrepreneurs, your husband is an entrepreneur. Uh, who who out of that group or outside of that group has inspired you? Who are your, you know, your key mentors? And what have you learned from these folks? What have you gained? I, you know, I've learned a lot of good and also things that maybe I don't want to do from that lifestyle. Um, like I said before, you know, my parents were very focused on instilling work ethic at a young age. And while I'm super grateful for that and it shaped me to who I am today, I've made the decision that I want my kids to be kids. And so as much as I want them to have good work ethic, like they'll get there when their mm -hmm. time is right. Um, from a mentor standpoint, I'm kind of a nerd in the sense that I read a lot of books. And if I read a book I really like, I reach out to the author and some of them respond and some of them don't. Um, and maybe four years ago, I read a book written by a young female entrepreneur. I reached out to her on LinkedIn. We formed this friendship. She's since become my coach. Um, and it's just funny because when I always thought of having like an executive coach, I thought of an older man, my industry is very male dominated. I thought that, you know, it would be a male mentor. Mm -hmm. And when I met this girl, her name is Kristen, she was 28 and I was 40. So oh. it was just never who I expected. Wow. Like I'm gonna learn from a younger female. And she she had a cleaning business, nothing to do with recruiting, but from a you know leadership standpoint, uh, humanizing the workforce, we have a lot of the same philosophies. So I would say she's probably inspired me the most even though you know she knows it, I've told her, but it was never, I never went out to seek her as my coach. It just kind of formed over years of conversation and respect for each other. That's unique. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if you write a book, Mike, I will find you and tell you exactly what I think of it. Okay, that's never happening, but <laughs> thank you. So do you think you'll ever uh, revisit the bags that you have? No, those are good for donations and gifts now. Um, nice. I think my husband would would probably kill me if I said I was going to have a moonlight business on the side at this point. Was were the, these the bags you were selling on eBay? No, I Different sold. Bills. Yes, I I know your wife had an eBay business too. Yeah. We talked about that a lot. Different mm -hmm. type of business. I was like buying new goods and reselling them, mm -hmm. um, and just I it started just doing it for family members that had something to sell that weren't tech savvy and. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's definitely like a thrill you get from selling and bidding and just being on a platform like that. So I just mm -hmm. went with it. So Charlie, what does your daily routine look like? The only thing I do consistently every day is brush my teeth. And I'm I'm proud of that. I do brush Good. my teeth. I'm a very inconsistent person that is just kind of go with the flow. So 
Um, when it relates to business, I think of myself as like more of a visionary than an executor. Mm -hmm. I'm the person that every morning I wake up and I slack someone on my team and I'm like, oh, I had this idea. And they're probably like, no more ideas. You know, it's always something. Um, but my, my routine, I am into yoga and meditation, which really centers me and grounds me. So I rarely start a work day without both of those. And like I told you before, morning walk. So um, I'm an early riser. I used to like it. Now I, I'm getting old. I don't like it, but it pays off. So get a lot done before most people are even sitting at their computer. Um, mm. And then I spend a lot of time in my office and I love the work I do. So um, my husband is a great partner helping with the kids behind the scenes, allowing me to really focus during the work day and um, sometimes, you know, at night and on the weekends. But I, I like my work, so it doesn't feel like a chore most of the time. That's that's key. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to find. Yeah, I've had I've had jobs where I've hated my what I was doing, and every minute seems like an hour. Yeah. But when you love when you're doing, it's the opposite. And the end I of the day that. comes around, and you're like, "That's it. I'm out of time." Like, okay, I'm, I I got to go spend some time with my family. That's not a bad thing. I'm not trying to say it like that, but no, I hear you though. I think yeah. I think that's you know a true entrepreneur always has something to do. Mm. Uh, you know, I have I've never had yes, I've taken days off and I've granted myself time away, but I have lists and lists of things I want to do or opportunities I want to seize and there's never enough time, but I can't say I've ever been bored for a moment in the last 12 years. I'm I'm always on to something. Mm -hmm. I I'm with you there. Yeah. I'm actually reading a book now called Laziness Does Not Exist. Um, we're reading it for a company book club. And it's really interesting because it's the whole philosophy is that this, this idea of someone being lazy is usually over producers that are hard on themselves. So like most people who are really lazy don't consider themselves lazy. It's probably people like us that just mm -hmm. go, go, go. And when you sit down to watch TV right. for a half hour, you're like, oh, I'm so lazy, but yet yeah. you deserve it. How do you how do you disconnect? Because I find that is one of the di most difficult things for me, especially with my phone. So I'm done with the work day. I spend a little time with the family. Then we can sit down in front of the TV together, maybe, and I'm right. I'm back on my phone working. Uh, it's just when you figure that out, let me know. Let yeah, me know. I I'm always joking, but I it will be a bucket list item that I want to just take like a silent retreat one day or, you know, mm. get away. I, that's how I think that I need to disconnect. And the, probably the only way I would truly disconnect is if somebody took my phone away and allowed me to just be with, be with myself and my thoughts for a while. I, know. I, know. I found it's... that setting a schedule to snooze email or Slack notifications mm. after a certain time can be helpful. You still have to have some, some self-restraint to not click into the app and go, Ooh, maybe there is something I need to respond to. And sure. obviously that can be challenging at times, but um, just not having every, I mean, I've, I've essentially turned most email notifications off because I know I will be still clicking into my email a handful of times a day, or I'll be on my computer the whole day. And like, okay, if something's coming through on a Saturday at 4 p.m., I don't, 99.9% .9 of the time, don't need to respond right. immediately. And that mm -hmm. just helps like, okay, there is some dedicated time when you aren't going to be getting the dings and the pings and that, that, yeah. that has helped a lot. We actually, we've had a policy in place for about three years when we were even still in the office where we do not send any emails after 6 p.m. or mm. over the weekend. And um, wow. you can schedule send, so I can do all my work at midnight, but mindful of other people and how they will respond and react when they get an email at that hour. Um, so let's just say a lot of people get emails from me at 8 a.m. when my, mm -hmm. you know, my computer restarts and, and they all go out. But um, that that was a big game changer for our team is just showing mutual respect. like work when you want, but don't make it someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that note, Donovan, I apologize for slacking you at 3 a.m. last night. Oh, it's that, fine. That, no did, worries, ha Mike. that yeah, did happen. I didn't get it. So. Oh, good. Perfect. <laughs> I didn't want you to get it. <laughs> but it was on your mind. You had to send it. I had to send it. Slack lets you schedule send too. Do you know that? I, I didn't know. Yeah. That's, that's a nice feature. Sounds like a great feature. 
Yeah, we're we're learning here. I appreciate this. We I, I like the idea of blocking times when you can't send anything. And yeah. and then with the scheduled send, I can still pour all my thoughts out and it will just all go, you know, when I'm able to send again. And sometimes you should leave it in your drafts because you wake up and you're like, did I really mm -hmm. that yesterday? Yeah. Is that really the tone I was going to use? And mm -hmm. a good night's sleep will usually, you know, put things in perspective. Yeah, well, yeah. and that's nice too, because it's, I mean, people will receive the messages when they're starting their work day and mm -hmm. they're ready to dive in and respond and work on whatever requests there may be versus seeing something at 8 PM. It's like, oh shoot. Okay. Either yeah. I do this now, or I'm going to be thinking about it for the rest of the night and then I have to tackle it tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And what that does to someone's psyche and stress levels, like it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. So you had mentioned that you are bringing on your first BDR, mm -hmm. uh, business development representative, a salesman, which yes. is exciting. Uh, what is what is your vision for this person, and what what is your goal of you know your next milestone that you want to reach? So we have expanded a lot with our services over the years. And what we find is that people have different perceptions of what we do. So if we go to a trade show for transportation providers, they know us as like the freight broker recruiters. If we go to a manufacturer's trade show, they know us as the manufacturing recruiters. So really trying to control the perception we have in the market that it's all connected it's all the same industry and we really recruit across the industry mm -hmm. so the the real purpose of having a business development rep is to go out and secure the jobs that we want to work on not to say with our inbound business you know we want to work on the jobs but what happens when you get referrals and word of mouth you get a lot of the same type of business so um mm -hmm. it's it's interesting when you do business development as a recruiter because there's job postings out there. So you know who's hiring, like you have a warm lead to start with, whether they sure. wanna use a recruiter or not is another question. Um, but that's really our vision with that is being very selective based on the candidate pool, based on what our recruiters are seeing in the market and using that to drive our business development strategy. Um, we also recently officially launched a consulting service, which, um, feels good because we've been giving away free advice for 12 years. So um, one of our clients said something a couple, maybe six, seven months ago. He's like, you need to monetize this. Like the information you just gave me is a courtesy. Another firm would have charged me for it. So um, really taking that to the next level and years and years of data around, you know, salaries, around mm -hmm. tenure roles, around performance and really just taking that data and telling a story with it as it relates to the talent market. So that's kind of phase two uh, of business development to eventually sell our consulting service. Right now we're seeing it usually as a result of a recruiting partnership where they need some sort of consultative information. Good luck with your growth. Uh yeah, yeah uh, that seems like a very natural yeah. extension um, from what yeah. you're working on. Just had one one other quick question before mm -hmm. we probably are or will be wrapping up for today. Yeah. Are there any? I mean, I'm sure there are. What have been some memorable roles that you have helped fill over the years? Like any position that you are ex exceptionally proud of, or any unique positions where it was kind of a challenge, like, hmm, we haven't really encountered anything like this mm -hmm. before. Let's see if we can find the right person. Anything come to mind? There's a lot of them. Um, I will say when we bring on clients with brand names and we, we do have a good portfolio of clients where we are using their product or their service, our team gets really excited and they're like, mm -hmm. I want to deliver on this because this is the water bottle I use, or that's the shampoo I use. Um, but we maybe three or four years ago, we filled a position for a Mandarin speaking automotive supply chain engineer in the middle of Indiana. So if we could do that and find someone who speaks Mandarin and knows automotive, when we got the job from our client, we like laughed. We're like, okay, what, what else do you want? Like you want a unicorn, but we found them. So it's just persistence and creativity and knowing how to market the opportunity. Um, but you tell us what you're looking for. Amazing. We'll tell you if it's in scope. That's specific. Yeah. So uh, any final nuggets of wisdom for our listeners before we call it a day? 
Oh, God, I have so many nuggets of wisdom. But um, I think, you know, where I would I would probably land today is there is a job out there for everyone that is fulfilling, that you will feel purpose, you will feel connection, and you have to be your own advocate. Nobody's going to necessarily help you unless a great recruiter reaches out to you. But um, I see a lot of people in my network that are just miserable. And I understand we all have to work to support our families and job searching could be you know, another full-time job, but network, think broadly, be creative. There, there is a job out there for everyone that will truly bring happiness and fulfillment. And um, you need to be patient, but you also need to be persistent and resourceful to get there. I like it. Yeah. All right, Charlie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been an enlightening conversation and best of luck to you with continued growth of CS recruiting. Um, and I hope to uh, run into you again in the randomly like we did through um, my last full-time job before I started my business um, and with some, maybe with some of my clients. I haven't really um, given you any referrals, but I'm going to start giving you some referrals. Well, we'll do I some don't know why. together. I don't know why I haven't, but. We'll get there. Uh, I will. Thank you. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure to chat with you and uh, cover some serious topics, but also yeah. hopefully some inspiring topics. For sure. Thanks. thanks, Charlie. Thanks, guys. Everybody got a dream. Let me show you all love from an idea, working it into a startup. That's this right. the show that you need. What more could you ask for? Never know who become the CEO next door. Uh, tune in. Every episode insightful. The type of vibe you will want to subscribe to. Let's go.